Um, when we're born, we don't have very many friends, do we? No. We are microbiologically sterile. That means we have no germs associated with our bodies. But that soon changes as mum and the relatives kiss and cuddle baby. They are effectively seeding baby with their own germs. And it's a fact that within a couple of weeks, baby is going to have more microbial cells than baby cells. I think that's great, but I'm a microbiologist, so I would think that, right? <laughs> Most of you probably find that thought rather abhorrent, more microbial cells. You are, in fact, mostly microbe in terms of total numbers of cells. And I think that's something great because these are protective. What I'm going to talk to you about today is the concept of good and bad in microbial terms. Good microbes, bad microbes, and how maybe it's possible to coexist, for us to coexist with bad microbes, not by force, not by killing them, but by increased understanding. Now, in my story today, as in any good yarn, I guess, there will be heroes and there will be villains. The hero of our story today is this fine, upstanding Streptococcus called Streptococcus salivarius. Now, when Streptococcus salivarius enters our story today, I would like you to respond with cheers and applause. <laughs> Can we try that, please? <laughs> Good. On the other hand, in many stories, there are villains. And the villain of the piece in our story today is this mean, miscreant microbe called Streptococcus pyogenes. When you see Streptococcus pyogenes appear, you will greet it, hopefully, with boos and derision. Streptococcus pyogenes. <laughs> Indeed, that's what I thought when as a 12-year-old growing up in the wilds of suburban Melbourne, I had an encounter, an encounter of the wrong kind with Streptococcus pyogenes. I had a strep sore throat, a strep sore throat that progressed to rheumatic fever. Now, every year, tens of thousands of young people worldwide die of the complications of rheumatic carditis. I didn't die, but something bad happened. I was put onto a course of penicillin. Not for a week, not for a month, but for a decade, I had to take penicillin tablets every day to stop me getting another bad encounter with Streptococcus pyogenes. A consequence of popping penicillin pills all that time was that I peed and perspired penicillin profusely <laughs> all through my teenage years. Not cool, not cool as a teenager <laughs> that every time you generate a sweat, you smell of a mushroom. <laughs> I can rem remember thinking more than once, there's just got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way to stop young people from having strep pyogenes infections. I had the chance to go to Melbourne University and at Melbourne University one of my lecturers, Dr. Mushin, told me her thoughts on a concept that she called microbial interference. And that she explained was the possibility of using microorganisms, friendly microorganisms, to fight the bad guys for us. Now, her interest was particularly in the intestine, so she fed us, the class, with intestinal probiotics to try to protect us against tummy infections. For me, though, sitting there and thinking about it, I thought, well, maybe the same principles could be applied to the throat. Maybe I could find a friendly bacterium to put in young children's throats to stop them from getting strep pyogenes infections. So essentially, at that point in time, my life was programmed. I knew what I must do in my life was to find a friendly, protective streptococcus. I had the chance to go and study 
in the United States with the person who I thought of as the king of the streptococci, the person at that stage who knew more about the bad streptococci than anyone else on the planet. And Louis Wanamaker, one day in the period of time I was there with him, said, John, I, I, I need to talk to you about strep pyogenes. Although you probably feel aggrieved about streptococcus pyogenes, that it did you this harm, I would like to suggest to you that streptococcus pyogenes doesn't deserve extermination. Possibly we could coexist with streptococcus pyogenes. What it needs, kind of like troubled youth, is understanding. It's just looking for a place to live. Set at proper limits and maybe we can coexist with strep pyogenes. I remember those words for the rest of my life of Lewis Wanamaker's. And then I had the chance to set up my own research laboratory 30 years ago here at the University of Otago. And the quest for me was on. I needed to find a friendly streptococcus. The way my quest went was to enrol a hundred um, five-year-old school children in Dunedin here and to follow them for six years to see if they equally got strep sore throats during their time at primary school. And much to my interest, about 10% of them got fewer strep pyogenes infection. When I looked in their mouths to see if they had any special bacteria in their mouths that might explain why they were not getting pyogenes acquisitions, I found to my delight that these children had <laughs> Streptococcus salivarius living on their tongue. Special Streptococcus salivarius that produced BLISS. Now BLISS is a ha happy little acronym for bacteriocin-like inhibitory substances. These are natural antibiotics that bacteria produce to stop their competing bacteria from growing too fast. So they are what we call anti-competitor molecules and it's a way that bacteria control the growth of other bacteria that might compete with them. So I had found now the magic, what I thought was the magic streptococcus, the streptococcus that could counter streptococcus pyogenes. That might have been the end of the story, but ten years ago I had a discussion with the late Howard Patterson. Howard Patterson was an entrepreneur here in Dunedin who at the time was interested in setting up biotech <coughs> companies and within a short period of my discussion with him I told him the bliss story, the same story that I've told you. He thought this might be a suitable, uh, might be a possibility for creation of a biotech company. And so Bliss Technologies Limited was founded in the year 2000 based on the prospect of using Bliss producing bacteria to prevent infections, bacterial infections of different parts of the body. So this was really quite exciting for me and now Bliss products including the, 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 flag, the, <laughs> the flagship one is this one K12. K12 is now sold in New Zealand and it's starting to sell into North America as well which is really quite exciting in a chewing gum format. So this is the world's first oral probiotic um, f with, with the bacteria, the live bacteria actually included in the chewing gum. So that's really been my story but remember back, cast your, your mind back to the baby right at the start. Knowing that the baby is very susceptible to being infected, what we are now doing is offering K12 bacteria to mums in the last month of their pregnancy. So the idea is colonize the mum and then when mum interacts with her baby, she will give the baby not only the kiss of love, but the kiss of bliss protection. A beautiful gift, I think, for mum to give her baby. So my story is told. I leave you with one last thought forever. May the bliss be with you.